Social Amnesia by Russell Jacoby, Chapter 3, Conformist Psychology. The neo-Freudian shift from a psychology of the unconscious to one of the conscious, from id to ego, sexuality to morality, repression to personality development, and most generally from libido and depth psychology to surface and cultural psychology, accelerated with the post-Freudians. The neo-Freudians had done their work well. Their successors no longer needed to respond to Freud. Psychoanalysis is too remote, too impersonal, too intellectual, too materialistic. The past is honored and forgotten. To replace it, neo-Freudians, neo-Freudian revisions are revised once again. Stripped of Freudian remnants, they arrive in an existential package. Themes of the real self, personality, actualization, authenticity, the password of a synthetic society, smooths the way. The core of the post-Freudian contribution is subjectivity. The subterranean explorations of Freud cast doubt on the autonomous subject. They revealed an individual shot through with sedimented layers of history. Reminders and remains of a psychic, carnal, and erotic conflict of men against men, men against civilization. The claim that the individual was a private preserve was exploded. The response of the Neo-Freudians and of the Post-Freudians who follow their lead is to shore up common sense, to assuage any suspicion that the individual is not master of the house. With the post-Freudians, the subject is affirmed and confirmed. Where psychoanalysis delves and dissects, the former accepts and combines. Where psychoanalysis is negative, the former, the former is inspirational. Neither the content nor the popularity of the post-Freudians can be abstracted from the social and cultural environment. Their work suggests liberation now without the sweat and grime of social change. They promise to unleash or tap the real self and real emotions, the authentic individual. From their perspective, the very move from a Freudian biological and instinctual psychology toward a humanist existential and personal one is proof of how far industrial society has progressed toward liberation. We are now ready for the final freedom, the subjective and psychological individual. <clears throat> Yet this may be exactly wrong. A different interpretation is possible. Subjectivity is disintegrating under the impact of a massified society. The ego or self-individuality, subjectivity, moves to the fore in psychological thought, just as in fact it is preparing to exit from existence. This is hardly an accidental development, because the ego's existence is challenged, Attention is focused on it. There is talk of identity and identity crises, security and insecurity, authenticity and bad faith, not because there is a viable ego faced with too many options, but because there is no ego faced with no options. The revisionists misread this, even as they correctly read it as the prevailing quest for security. As with much of their analysis, this is true but superficial. Hence, false. This particular misreading throws into relief the distinction between Freud's alleged biologism and the cultural accent of the neo- and post-Freudians. It becomes evident that Freud's biologism is concentrated history, while the historical consciousness of the post-Freudians is dressed-up biology. For the revisionists, take what is a product of history and society, anxiety and insecurity, and translate it into a universal element of man's being, into biology. They gain existential and lose history, or they gain existentialism and lose history. Fromm wrote that life and its mental and spiritual aspects is by necessity insecure and uncertain. Free man is by necessity insecure. Within psychoanalytic theory, anxiety and insecurity are not universalized but are read as the price that a re repressive civilization exacts from the individual. 
Observing the prevalence of inner resolution and craving for authority, Freud stated that one of its principal causes was the impoverishment of the ego due to the tremendous effort in repression demanded of every individual by culture. The orientation of the theory is clear. Personal insecurity is a direct response to collective repression. It is not a universal component of man's essence. In other terms, repression is not obsolete. Rather, it assumes a new form which is manifested by the threatened ego's quest for security. To be secure in one's property and person is one of the oldest bourgeois war cries. The cry is rehearsed when one's psychic person is endangered. The social forces are squeezing out the individual as an inefficient unit. The cost of securing and expanding advanced capital is private insecurity. Engels once wrote that although organized labor is able in a certain measure to retard the growth of misery, what certainly grows is the uncertainty of existence. The existence of insecurity is due to the insecurity of existence. This is registered in but is not comprehended by the popular ego psychology of the Neo and post Freudians. They mirror, not penetrate, surface phenomena. The drive for security is accepted as such and is not traced to an insecure existence within the insecure collectivity. As, as with Adler, secondary and primary things are confused. In the confusion, the negative is lost. Personality and identity become, becoming an authenticity move to the fore as unadvertised specials of the affluent society, which already is a bargain hunter's delight. When material needs are largely satisfied, writes Carl Rogers, as they tend to be for many people in this affluent society, individuals are turning to the psychological world, groping for a greater degree of authenticity and fulfillment. The clear distinction between material and psychic needs is already the mystification. It, ca it capitulates to the ideology of the affluent society, which affirms the material structure is sound conceding only that some psychic and spiritual values might be lacking. Exactly this distinction sets up authenticity and fulfillment, as so many more commodities for the shopper. Rather, it is the fisher itself which is the source of the ills. Between work and free time, material structure and psychological world, producers and consumers. Rogers accepts the fisher and prescribes a double dose as the cure. After a hard day on the job, the weary are to unwind with a little authenticity. This is the same message forced in through every pore by the media. The attention of the discontented is diverted from the source to the surface. One is to suppose that the emptiness of life is due more to the reruns on television than to the runaround itself. Against Freud's 19th century provincialism, one is offered 20th century ideology. Ideology is the content and form of all ports becoming, published the same year, 1955, as Eros and Civilization. If the latter strives to articulate the contradictions of the social reality, the former seeks to silence them. The latter speaks of repression, the former of becoming. There is little suggestion that today to become is to succumb, to capitulate, all port talks another language, one scraped clean of negativity. It only affirms and confirms. Hints still found in the neo Freudians of sickness and neurosis, sexuality and repression, civilization and its discontents are unacknowledged and unknown. The sublimation that sexuality underwent with the neo Freudians is the starting place for more. The result is a text befitting the high school graduation speeches. It is undoubtedly inspired. Happiness is the glow that attends the integration of the person while pursuing or contemplating the attainment, the attainment of goals. The consciousness or the superego super derived by Freud from the power and violence of the father and society and rooted in the dread of group exorcism is banalized to a value-related obligation a wholly positive and immediate sense of obligation, of self-consistency. Lingering thoughts of neurosis and sickness 
doubts about the price and toll of civilized repression are admitted only to be waved aside as thoughts for and of the sick. A report reaches Allport that after the turmoil of painful symptoms subsides, many patients still ask the question, what do I live for? But these distressing cases, however frequent, merely underscore their departure from the human form or the human norm. The human norm is unthink unthinkingly upheld as if it were truth itself, not the coagulated terror and misery of individual and social history. If Freud examines the neurotic and the sick, Allport sticks to the normal and the cheerful. The sick must be avoided, for their very existence puts into question what is not to be questioned, the rationality of the whole. Allport inches close to the basic bourgeois notion that linked the unemployed vagabonds and the mad as twin violators of virtue and sanity. He writes, alluding to Freud, that some theories of becoming are based largely upon the behavior of sick and anxious people. Fewer theories have derived from the study of healthy human beings. Thus we find today many studies of criminals, few of law abiders, many of fear, few of courage, more on hostility than on, aff on affiliation, much on blindness in man, little on his vision. The positive and inspirational note is not accidental. As Marcuse observes, the Neo-Freudians read like Sunday sermons. So do the post-Freudians. The positive is promoted so as to drive out the negative. One strives to be cheery because it is a cheerless world. Since reflection on the latter is taboo, all port, like others, seeks to make palatable the unswallowable, the lie that the isolated and abandoned individual can become, love, be. Hence, the how-to nature of their works. In this they follow from who denies the self-help cell, even as he affirms it. In the art of loving, he tells us not to expect easy instructions in the art of loving. One finds, however, instructions. The rub, apparently, is that to love, one needs a total personality. It is off-limits for the alienated. With that established, one can begin. If we want to learn how to love, we must proceed in the same way we have to proceed if we want to learn any other art, say music, painting, carpentry, or the art of medicine or engineering. As with carpentry, there are four prerequisites. Discipline, concentration, patience, and supreme concern. Unlike carpentry, however, in loving one should avoid bad company, whose orbit is poisonous and depressing. Rollo May, in Man's Search for Himself, accepts the designation of a self-help book. No cheap and instant cures are preferred, we are told, but in a worthy and profound sense, every good book is a self-help book. It helps the reader gain new light on his own problems of personal integration. One helps oneself because collective help is inadmissible in rejecting the realm of social and political practice or praxis. Individual helplessness is redoubled and soothes itself through self-help, hobbies, and how-to manuals. It is an old formula to keep bourgeois society on its tracks. While business dominates mind and body, one is admonished to mind one's own business. Rebellion acts as a substitute for the more difficult processes of struggling through to one's own autonomy, to new beliefs, writes Rollo May as if one could struggle through to one's own autonomy without rebelling. The eclipse of freedom by economic oligarchies is not necessary, Rollo May tells us. They need not destroy freedom if we keep our, pers keep our perspective. Now we have time for inward psychological and spiritual freedom. The perspective that guarantees freedom, inward freedom, is the first gimmick of the apologist. An unjust reality is spiritualized away. With some persistence, everyone is or can be free. The full litany of virtues that the rich once preached to the poor are restored to service. Inward courage, discipline, strength, humility are preferred by these homespun philosophers as a patent medicine for a lethal civilization. 
The question of which age we live in is irrelevant, writes May, in an age of genocide and technological bombing. No traumatic world situation can rob the individual of the privilege of making the final decision with regard to himself, even even if it is only to affirm his own fate, he tells us, as if affirming one's own death and not life itself were the essence of freedom. An existential impulse is common to many of the post-Freudians. May, Alport, Maslow, and Rogers all contributed to a small volume entitled Existential Psychology. It is, however, an existentialism thoroughly cleansed and sterilized of its European accents, so as to be fit for home consumption. Its grating edges have been ground down in the name of a happy-go-lucky American ethos. Whatever truth there is to the clichés that European existentialism was spurred by the death camps and resistance to fascism, and hence is tinged with pessimism and gloom, is too much truth for its American representatives. They want an existentialism that poses no threats to their optimism and good cheer. European existentialism, we are told by Allport, is too preoccupied with dread, anguish, despair, and nausea. American existentialism is more optimistic. Or, writes May, the tragic aspects of existentialism do not mean it is pessimistic. Quite the contrary. Or Maslow informs us that we need not take too seriously the European existentialists harping on dread, on anguish, on despair, and the like. We need not take it seriously, for within the American scene, the negative turns into a positive, an added attraction for the already popular main event. Tragedy, aloneness, death render life more profound. Maslow talks of the tragic sense of life, as if it were the special flavor of the month. It is to spark an otherwise dull selection. It adds dimension of seriousness and profundity of living, which is to be contrasted with the shallow and superficial life. A pinch of death is prescribed as the antidote to the dull life. If, as Adorno has remarked, Heidegger transforms the fact of death into a professional secret for academics, the existential psychologists tell the secret to a public that has already heard the news. They promote dying as if it were going out of business. The formula that Maslow follows is an old one. Add soul to misery and injustice, and they turn soulful and virtuous. The designation of deep, profound, authentic as applied to existence, meaning art, which recurs throughout the writings of the post freudians follows the worst of a romantic tradition. The inability to conceptualize, to articulate the content of existence or art, makes way for glorification and edification. The reified mind is awed to thoughtless respect before the mere fact of culture, as if it were automatically profound. Hegel, undoubtedly unread by these existentialists, dubbed it empty depth. Even as there is an empty breadth, there is also an empty depth, an intensity void of content, pure force without any spread, which is identical in superficiality. Or, as he wrote elsewhere, what possesses a deep meaning means absolutely nothing. All of this is believed to constitute progress in psychology, or in psychological thought. The Neo-Freudians balked at Freud's interest in sexuality and the psychic past. In their place, they put moral and cultural problems of the adult. Neurosis itself, wrote Fromm, is, in the last analysis, a symptom of moral failure. The post-Freudians take off from there as if they were pioneers of the backcountry, exploring a well-policed suburbia. One's present philosophy of life may hold the key to one's conduct, writes Allport. Discoveries that patriotism or stamp collecting could be ultimate needs, and not sexual desire, are presented as if they were the long-suppressed truth, and not as they are long-oppressive common sense. The regression to a pre-Freudian position, where one knows nothing of the unconscious, repression, and sexuality, but only of surface motives, interests, and desires, is claimed to be a great advance. 
this confusion bestows on the discoverers of banality the air of courage and adventure. They defend the status quo as if it were the revolution. They creep toward the line of the reactionary, which has it that it takes nerve to defend the establishment nowadays, and it is conformist to attack it. In reality, until the reified society dissolves, it is the reverse. So too with intellectual disciplines such as sociology and psychology. One attacks Marxism as if one's career might well be wrecked and not secured by it. Or psychoanalysis is presented as if it were state policy, thus implying its critics are rebels. Similarly, the continual use of the first person in the writings of post-Freudians suggests that they are putting themselves on the line, when in fact they are towing it. Aside from some gentle jabs at crude behaviorism, little characterizes this ex existentialism better than its intellectual obsequies obsequiousness. To read a collection such as Allport's Personality and Social Encounter is to find the banalities of the age set forth as exciting research projects for the future. Colleagues, friends, acquaintances are continually commended for naming things already named, discovering things already discovered, suggesting things everyone knows. Continual thanks is offered to philosophers, sociologists, theologians, as hom homogenous groups for reminders, suggestions, contributions, assumed as a harmonious universe where contradictions have melted into good-natured friendships between departments, monotonously restating the same point. The project of deepening Freud by appending values, meaning, and morality to a psychic and carnal reality is one of diluting by adding. Profundity is supposedly gained by relocating the misery of life from the material to the spiritual. Such a tactic, Adorno wrote, runs the risk of the culture critic, who, bemoaning, bemoaning the breakdown of values, ascribes the problem to the advanced state of the human spirit rather than the retarded state of society. The world is too materialistic, we are told, and we need some spiritual values to patch things up. The patching bespeaks the usefulness of the spiritual values supposedly beyond the infamy of the material world. Abstracted from the realm of truth they once inhabited, they are promoted for what they can do, not what they are. Religion, divested of truth, turns synthetic and pragmatic. Rollo May tells us religion is useful as it strengthens the person in his sense of his own dignity and worth, aids him in his confidence. The spiritual values bear the imprint of the non-spiritual market, exchange value. Nothing is for itself. Everything is for something else. Pragmatism reigns supreme. Religion and philosophy degenerate to a radio format. Early morning pitches to sustain one through a joyless day. The superficial critique of a spiritless reality by confusing bad materialism with too much materialism, mollifies the discontented into taking more of the same. A passage from Viktor Frankl's Psychotherapy and Existentialism illustrates the existentialist's sham deepening of Freud and psychoanalysis. He wants to add to Freud's depth psychology of the instincts and the unconscious, a height psychology that does justice to man's higher aspects and aspirations. Freud was enough of a genius to be aware of the limitations of his system, such as when he confessed to Ludwig Binswanger that he had always confined himself to the ground floor and basement of the edifice. Here, as elsewhere, those who come after the genius update and improve him. Yet Freud's remarks to Binswanger are not as Frankel presented them. They are the opposite. Freud knew well enough and criticized often enough the tendency especially among the Swiss, such as Feister, Binswanger, Jung, to sublimate, sublimate psychoanalysis into religion and morality by ignoring its psychic and erotic base. This was the approved way of making his limited system more acceptable. It was no welcome addition, and further in his remarks to Binswanger, which Frankel omits and thereby distorts, 
Freud observed the political meaning of such revisions and sublimations. He wrote to Binswanger, You have failed to convince me. I have always confined myself to the ground floor and basement of the edifice. You maintain that by changing one's point of view, one can also see an upper story in which dwell such distinguished guests as religion, art, etc. You are not the only one to say this. Most cultured specimens of homo natura think the same thing. In this you are conservative and I revolutionary. Another passage from Allport crystallizes the mode as well as the content of a central post-Freudian revision. In an, in an essay from 1953 which advances the novel idea that the best way to discover what a person is trying to do is to ask him, Allport states, I am fully aware of the heterodoxy in suggesting that there is, in a restricted sense, a discontinuity between normal and abnormal motivation and that we need a theory that will recognize this fact. The first-person formulation, Allport's full awareness of the heresy, suggests a risk that is nowhere to be found. He alludes to the courage of the heretic while colluding with the authorities. His heterodoxy is to defend the established church. Everyday wisdom has it that the healthy and the mad belong in and should be put in different worlds. One of Freud's greatest contributions was his insistence on the reverse, that normal and abnormal, health, healthy and sick formed a continuum. Differences were merely quantitative, but not qualitative. As he said in his American lectures, let me at this point state the principal finding to which we have been led by the psychoanalytic investigations of neurotics. The neuroses have no special psychic content that is peculiar to them, and that might not equally be found in healthy people. Here, as elsewhere, the effort of the neo-Freudians and post-Freudians has been to shunt aside the unpleasantness of Freudian theory. Where Freud insists on the bond between the healthy and sick, they opt for the good news that keeps them separate. Maslow's entire psychology is oriented toward the healthy and towards saving them from contamination by the ill. He prefers a direct study of good rather than bad human beings, of healthy rather than sick people. The world of suffering and misery of the damaged and maimed melts away. Maslow's remembering to remind indicates how much he has forgotten. We should be careful to note that the tendency to grow toward full humanness and health is not the only tendency to be found in the human being. The fetish of health success adjustment finds expression in the case histories presented. Freud's cases concern the sexually unfree with deep anxiety and phobias. The existentialists rather turn to presidents, administrators, astronauts to tell us about the secrets of existence. Maslow's, Maslow inspires us with the achievements of Olympic gold medal winners. Allport is fond of, this, of the story of man whose dominant passion was to be a polar explorer. His success in this presents the issue squarely, how a central commitment enables one to withstand other temptations. Elsewhere, in telling us how a healthy adult develops an active value schema, which in turn exerts a dynamic influence upon specific choices, he cites the case of a Harvard president. The formula for his mode of operation, that of the overworked administrator, is that each specific issue fits readily into one of a few dominant categories, schemata of value. If the administrator is clear in his own mind concerning his value orientation, decisions on specific issues automatically follow. So a tale of value integration, so a tale of value integration, a standard technological and bureaucratic mode of classification is presented as the latest contribution to humanity. Viktor Frankl, connoisseur of meaning and existence, sums it up. Psychology, the effort to fathom the psyche of the autonomous individual, here passes into its negation. Open ideology for the forces and powers that render the autonomous individual and psyche irrelevant. He quotes a height psychologist to the effect that what is needed is a basis of convictions and beliefs so strong that they lifted individuals clear out of themselves and caused them to live and die for some aim nobler and better than themselves. 
he adds, and who is this height psychologist that I have just quoted? The speaker was not a logotherapist, nor a psychotherapist, a psychiatrist, or a psychologist, but the astronaut Lieutenant Colonel John H. Glenn Jr. The words leave little to add. This psychology is the ideology of conformism and synchronization in the era of late capitalism. The reality of violence and destruction of psychically and physically damaged people is not merely glossed over, but buried beneath the lingo of self, meaning authenticity, personality. The more these cease to exist, the more they are invoked. Personality suspect in its heyday is hawked as just the thing for a life already too much a thing. The concepts are less than critical. They are blank checks that endorse the prevailing uh, malpractices with cheery advice on inner strength and self-actualization. Maslow's peak experience is the misery of everyday life condensed. Liberation is a banal existence plus enthusiasm, he says as, mu he says as much. My retrospective impression is that the most fully human people, a good deal of the time, live what we could call an ordinary life. Shopping, eating, being polite, going to the dentist, thinking of money, meditating profoundly over a choice between black shoes or brown shoes, going to silly movies, reading ephemeral literature. There can be no doubts here. The ordinary is extraordinary because it is ordinary. The alchemists of liberation transmute the base wares of capitalism into the treasures of humanity. The post-Freudians are philosophically autodidactic. In an age when obsolete autodidactic autodidacticism is officially perpetuated, a sympathetic appraisal of their writings can only conclude that they have fallen victim to the ravages of the intellectual division of labor, which condemns the intellectual voyager to provincialism. As eagerly as they welcome the philosophy of existentialism, they know little of social theory or philosophy. For this reason, they turn out to be the enthusiastic exponents of the prevailing ideology, even as they intend to oppose it. Because they are unacquainted with the theory, philosophy, or history of positivism, their critique of behaviorism, ultimately their raison d'etre, does not resist behaviorism, but complements it. They add soul and values to the facts, thereby fantasizing that the facts themselves change. The naive critique of a value-free factual science issues into a naive celebration of American values themselves, th themselves the products of these facts. Misconceiving the essence of positivism, they conceive the alternative as a renamed more of the same. Unable to escape the dilemmas of non-dialectical, non-theoretical thought, they are forced to choose between bad materialism and bad idealism. The prevailing divisions in the intellectual turf condemn them to witless weeding of measured yards. Their failure is not theirs alone. The decline of philosophy takes place also within philosophy proper. The professional philosopher, in keen competition with the natural scientist, resolves to be more certain about less. As Freud himself said of approaches which fetishize methodology and ignore content in the name of certainty, these critics who limit their studies to methodological investigations remind me of people who are always polishing their glasses instead of putting them on and seeing with them. The result is that others, non-professional philosophers, pick up the discards, values, existence, and handle them as fragile chunks of pure philosophy that would be damaged, uh, damaged by analysis. In both cases, within and outside philosophy, the social and political content that defines and informs the concepts drops off. The irrelevancy of the technical philosoph philosophical expert generates a response that desperately wants the reverse to be relevant. Especially in North American psychology, both options are especially crude. Mechanistic behaviorism and vapid existentialism. Neither are adequate to an antagonistic reality that turns half-truths into non-truths. It is impossible here to do more than suggest a critique of positive thought. 
the difficulty is compounded by the prevailing reified consciousness. The victory of positive thought is so total that the fundamentals of dialectical thought are not so much rejected as not considered. Hence, it is nonsense, if not a scandal, to suggest the precepts of a critical theory, i.e. what is immediate as sense perception is not concrete, but abstract, or the alternative. The concrete is gained by, by mediation, by working through the immediate, not accepting it. Yet such notions lie close of the life, or close to the life nerve of dialectical thought, which explains that what is tossed up to view and touch can be viewed and touched, but itself depends on a political and social universe, which is not immediately here or now. The facts are conditioned by the factors, society as a whole. To fasten on the facts while forgetting the social content is to fall prey to a mystifying immediacy. In an antagonistic society, appearance and essence, immediacy and mediacy diverge. Things are not what they seem to be. The whole is the truth and the whole is false. Dialectical logic is loyal to the contradictions, not by the reasoning of um, on the one hand and on the other, but by tracing the contradictions to their fractured source. Positivism exists in more than one form. To be aware of these forms is to become aware of their internal connection and to be wary of alternatives that offer the same while promising relief. The existential psychologists in reacting to behaviorism implicitly or explicitly identify positivism as a repressive scientific discipline which leaves out the human element. And so it does. The positivism of this sort is one part of a complex story. Within Germany, positivism expressed itself differently and predated in name and fact the positivism that is more associated with St. Simon and Comte. A positive theory of law and history was developed that emphasized against abstract and formal thought the living and concrete individuality, uniqueness, and particularity of phenomena that defied classification. This positivism sought to defend the particular and the concrete against the general and the abstract. This form of positivism, which is generally neglected in studies and critiques of positivism, as well as the quasi-natural scientific positive, positivism, were subjected to criticism by Hegel and Marx. If the neo-natural science type formulated general scientific laws which deliberately ignored the particular and the individual, the concrete positivism defended the existing individualities against abstract thought. Uh, the interconnection between these positivisms was an explicitly conservative orientation toward preserving and defending the existing reality. With St. Simon and Comte, it was directed against the negativity of the French Revolution. As Comte wrote, the task of positivism was to imbue the people with the feeling that no political change is of real importance. The German form, also to be found in Burke, differed in mode. The positive was identified with the inorganic, with that which grew naturally out of the existing reality, individuality, particularity, local customs, and laws. As Marx wrote, to it, everything that exists is an authority. The point is that the German positivism is no less a positivism than the French variety, and in its form and content is akin to the existential psychological variety. The irony is that Maslow's efforts in the direction of what he even calls positive psychology, dealing with fully functioning and healthy human beings, and not sick ones, is well within the alternatives offered by positivism itself. The jargon of personality, values, becoming, being, health, is no escape from mechanical behaviorism, but its reverse side. Even the French positivism, it should be noted from St. Simon through to Durkheim, possessed an emphatic moral and religious element that was to compete its fetish, that was to complete its fetish of the facts. The positive of these positivisms is characterized not so much by a definite form as by a definite content. The interconnection between a positivism of numbers and quantities and one of human values and qualities is the excision, 
ex excision, excision of a critical distance in theory. Both surrender to different faces of reality, its facts or its ideology, and both stay clear and clean of antagonisms and contradictions. Existentialism in its philosophical and psychological form, like concrete positivism, sought an immediacy that avoided the abstractions of concepts and mechanical models. Rollo May contrasts a psychology of forces, drives, and reflexes with one of being. Existential psychology, he tells us, centers upon the existing person. It is the emphasis on the human being as he is emerging, becoming. The terms employed, existence, being, man, authenticity, promise concreteness. Yet to critical theory, this very concreteness is gained by abstraction. Concepts such as being or existence possess the flavor of concreteness, not its substance. As Adorno has written in his critique of German existentialism, uh, jargon of authenticity, such concepts reflect reality rather than comprehend it. They are the reified transcendence of reification. The concept of human existence, for example, if compared to the concept of class existence, may seem more concrete and immediate and universal. But class existence may be more concrete, not in the immediate, but in indicating the social process that shapes human existence into its prevailing configuration, inhuman for some and human for others. The concept of human existence suggests an abstract human condition. Class existence indicts bad conditions. The former suggests a non-existent egalitarianism, as if master and slave, owner and worker, bomber and bombed, all participate in the same universal abstraction. The conditions, however, are very different and are derived from the social and political whole. The human condition for the rich is the inhuman one for the impoverished. The neat subsumption of an unjust society under concepts such as existence and being is abstract. It does violence to a concrete reality that is unequally violent. Existentialism tilts over into ideology empty moralizing on the being of man. Its egalitarianism exists today only in the negative. For just this reason, Marcuse attacked the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre. It presupposes a fraudulent equality in which there is no difference between classes and categories of people. Everyone is reduced to an abstract denominator of a universal essence. What lurks behind this existentialism is the ideology of free competition, free initiative, and equal opportunity. Everybody can transcend his situation, carry out his own project. Everybody has his absolutely free choice. However adverse the conditions, man must take it and make compulsion his self-realization. The existential concepts are pseudo-concrete they parasitically live off the surface of reality while killing the concrete mediations that are decisive. The social process that determines that all are not equally free and unfree, equal neither to be nor become. One talks of man when there are psychically and physically maimed men and women. The jargon seduces the theory which is seeking to comprehend the conditions that perpetrate the damage. In shifting the attention from inhuman conditions to man himself, it seconds these conditions. Hence, Adorno's remark, uh, man is the ideology of dehumanization. Existentialism in its American psychological form barely knows its theoretical sources. For that reason, the weakness of European philosophical existentialism is only redoubled by the post-Freudians. With barely a glance toward objective reality, a blinkered and constricted view of self becoming authenticity is promoted. That to be or to become in a society whose being is one of mass administration and blatant violence is hardly acknowledged as a problem. What must be acknowledged, for example, the prevalence of anxiety is grafted onto man's essence as if it grew there. Such is the tried and tested method of the apologist. What is social in origin is presented as natural and human. 
Maslow does not shy away from recommending a little grief and pain for growth and self-fulfillment, as if their short supply would stunt the individual. Humanist psychology turns into its opposite. Blind to pain, it recommends more as a cure for too much. Existentialism is bourgeois ideology in the hour of its retreat, because it is no longer able to pierce the mystifications. It settles on the subject, the self. The more the surface of reality deflects attention, the more the deflected focus on the individual. One seeks to compensate for the damages of an external reality by internal scrutiny. The hope is to fan some warmth out of the dead embers as protection against the chill of the outside. It does not work. The subject abstracted from the social context decays into a thing. The very ill existentialism was to cure. What Adorno writes of a tendency of psychoanalysis is true for existential psychology. The more strictly the psychological realm is conceived as an autonomous, self-enclosed play of forces, the more completely the subject is drained of his subjectivity. The objectless subject that is thrown back on himself freezes into an object. The fetish of facts by one school of positivism is countered by the fetish of subjectivity by another. The more the development of late capitalism renders obsolete, or at least suspect, the real possibilities of self, self-fulfillment, and actualization, the more they are emphasized as if they could spring to life through an act of will alone. Hence the naivety that clings to a name such as Center for Studies of the Person, with which Carl Rogers is identified, as if the person existed in a no-man's land of free-floating interpersonal relations, and not in a society that threatens to reify the last spontaneous movements. The modern individual is in the process of, dis of disintegration. To forget this is to abet the process, not aid the resistance. The existential stress on free and autonomous actions and decisions is a reflex response to a society that is eliminating them. Even French existentialism, for all its despair, Adorno has remarked, is too optimistic. The existentialists bank on an individual solution to the general bankruptcy. The philosophical naivety of the post-Freudians is thrown into relief by a question that must be broached. Although it cannot be fully developed, the problematic nature of humanism. The existential psychologists and post-Freudians on occasion call their psychology humanistic. At least the stress on man for himself, man the measure, existing man expresses the humanist drift of their thought. The progressive note that would unite anyone from Marx to Maslow need hardly be emphasized. Against doctrines that presented reality as given by nature or God and so located it beyond human change, humanism maintained the relevancy and centrality of man, that is, men and women as actors and creators. The sentence from the early Marx is often cited, to be radical is to go to the root of things, and at the root is man himself. On this level among Marx, the existentialists and liberals, there is little disagreement. Fundamental differences arise, however, among all these humanists. In brief, what is in question is mediation, the route from the world of things back to the human source. The subject is not, as it were, a straight line. If the social reality is ultimately derived from individuals, it is not immediately. Rather, it has a drift, a momentum, a weight of its own. For that reason, social reality has laws of development that are not identical with the laws of the individual psyche. In the face of misunderstanding both within and without Marxism, one must be absolutely clear here. The laws of social development are not identical with the laws in the natural sciences. The content of the social laws is not nature, but second nature, coagulated history. They are man-made, but they also make men. They are dialectical, at once subject and object, neither totally, one or the other. With Marxism, humanism is dialectical. It testifies to the objectivity of social reality without fetishizing it or ignoring human subjectivity. Ultimately, human labor, which is its source. 
liberal thought as well as some forms of Marxism tends to fetishize one or the other moment. To present social reality as utterly independent from man or directly and immediately under his rule. The danger of the latter, more important in the context here, is that it lapses into pure subjectivity. Social reality, divested of its objectivity, is psycho psychologized away. Psychologism, to follow Adorno, falls under the sway of contingency and becomes untrue. In reducing everything to the subject and denying the objective truth, it loses the ability to distinguish between delusions and realities. Psychologism is the constitutional failing of psychology, psychoanalysis included. Social processing conflicts are read as psychological and individual ones. Society is conceived as simply an individual or psychological pact between men, not as a piece of reality with its own social gravity. The credo of the humanist is reductio ad hominem. In the eagerness to find humanity, it is seen everywhere, forgetting and so perpetrating the social manufacture of inhumanity. Because everything is immediately human, one need only be a bit more human to cure the evil. This attitude presented as part of the opposition is in fact part of the prevailing zeitgeist. A paradigm could be the social perception of automobile accidents and slaughter. Insofar as one can calculate in advance the number of dead and maimed for each weekend, each day, automobile accidents are more than accidents. They form a part of the murderous necessity that keeps the coffers filled. Private automobiles over public transportation, highways over railroads, are not merely consumer choice. They are dictated by a social reality which in the drive towards surplus value has dictated the choices. A rational and human mode of transportation would threaten capitalist accumulation, so an irrational mode is preserved. This is a social and real configuration of inhumanity against which the single human individual is helpless. Yet aside from minor and insignificant improvements in safety design, one assumes the driver is at fault. In the same breath as we are told how many are to die this weekend, we are told to drive especially carefully, as if the latter had any effect on the former. It does not. The accidents are no accidents. They are embedded in the social reality. Accidents are a form of necessity under conditions of unfreedom. The response is humanistic, an appeal to the driver to heed the road, and not the social processes that recklessly manufacture the accidents. Attention to the latter may do more than take the driver's attention off the road, it might suggest that safety lies in collective action, dismantling a dangerous society. Using the same approach, the humanists would have it that alienation is a problem of human sensitivity and is not extruded from the bourgeois mode of production. Rogers and Encounter Groups writes that the Encounter Group movement will be a growing counterforce to the dehumanization of our culture. Proposed is not the dissolution of dehumanization, but its humanization. The brutal totality is accepted as given. Unacceptable are only uh, some of the joints that squeak and groan. Annoying light sleepers. The blindness toward the reality that desensitizes. The fixation on incidentals expose the ideological content of the sensitivity. One is sensitive toward the immediate and indifferent toward the more distant social forces which define the immediate. One of the most imaginative ow, I just bit my tongue. One of the most imaginative uses of encounter groups has been in dealing with the psychological problem that develop when two companies merge, writes Rogers. The unholy alliance between monopoly capital and the center for studies of the person is no sacrilege. The concern of the former for pacifying its employees, like the concern of the latter, is not malicious, but is grounded in the lie of bourgeois society that they both share. The ills are subjective. The objective whole is driven from mind by a program of feel more, think less. The imaginative use of sensitivity to aid monopolization is real politic. Sensitivity turns out to be the grim business of helping business against the hapless individual. That the intent is otherwise changes nothing. The individual is led to believe that with a little help, a little self-help, 
alienation would be washed down the drain like dirt in a sparkling sink. Rogers's encounter groups for all its sensitivity and testimonies, and because of them, is copy for the campaign of self manipulation is copy for the campaign of self manipulation in an age of mass manipulation. The attitude of Rogers and others toward the concept and fact of role crystallizes the difference between a positive humanism and a dialectical one. To them, the concept and fact of roles are a violation of humanity. The role is a facade, consciously assumed, so as to hide the real self. In an intensive group experience, it is often possible for a person to peep within himself <clears throat> and see the loneliness of the real being who lives inside his everyday shell or role. The notion here is simple. The real person is locked within the artificial, the role, and needs a little encouragement to step out into the fresh air. As with the Neo-Freudians, society is conceived as an external factor, an outside force acting on the individual, but not decisively casting the individual from without and from within. This mechanical conception, severing within and without, and presupposing that only the outside is prey to social forces, is assumed or stated throughout the post-Freudian writings. Their humanism derives from the insistence that roles are an alienated mode of behavior. Critical theory goes further than the post-Freudians. It admits what the humanists, in their impatience to find humanity everywhere, deny. That roles are not only fraudulent, they are also real. Roles are not merely adopted by the subject as a facade that can be dropped with a little willpower. willpower. They are an alienated mode of behavior, custom fit for an alienated society. The neat division between roles and real selves reduces society to a masquerade party. Yet not even plastic surgery can heal the psychic disfigurements. The social evil reaches into the living fibers. People not only assume roles, they are roles. This admission is no concession to inhumanity. Rather, in, in articulating the full strength of the prevailing inhumanity, it holds forth the hope of its material transcendence. The insistence, on the other hand, on finding humanity everywhere by underestimating the objective and social foundation of inhumanity perpetuates the latter. It humanizes inhumanity. Critical theory seeks to preserve both moments in their contradiction, roles as true and false. They are true insofar as they are not merely a paper-thin facade, but are inextricably entangled with the individual and false insofar as they are the mode of behavior of an unfree society. For this reason, a psychology or sociology of roles is not simply to be rejected as inhuman and brutal. Rather, it testifies to the real processes of this society that annihilate the individual and autonomy. Yet to the, yet to the degree that such a psychology or sociology is unconscious, that is, to the degree that it accepts roles as natural and human, and not estranged human behavior, it is ideological. The concept of role lifted without analysis from the social facade helps perpetuate the monstrosity of role playing itself. The reflex rejection of role psychology and kindred methods of rat and behavioral psychology as violations of the human spirit is, however, no less ideological. These types of psychology and sociology mirror the actual inhumanity of reality. Rat psychology is human psychology where total society has trained human beings to be creatures of stimulus and response, i.e. rats. Insofar as the hardening of society has reduced men more and more to objects, wrote Adorno, methods which convey this are no sacrilege. The unfreedom of the method serves freedom in that it wordlessly testifies to the prevailing unfreedom. Or as Adorno and Horkheimer wrote in another context, the usual objection that empirical social research is too mechanical, too crude, and too unspiritual shifts the responsibility from that which science is investigating to science itself. The much castigated inhumanity of empirical methods still is more humane than the humanizing of the inhuman. This last refers to the idealistic misconception of the humanist protesting roles behavioral methods, and the like, 
It shifts the evil from the social conditions that coerce men and women into standardized roles onto the social science that is merely registering these conditions. Its inhumanity consists in that instead of changing the conditions that dehumanize, it is satisfied with a change in method, as if by humanist rhetoric alone the inhuman conditions will be dissolved. In his discussion of the method of classification and topology used in the authoritarian personality, Adorno wrote, individualism opposed to inhuman pigeonholing may ultimately become a mere ideological veil in a society which actually is inhuman and whose intrinsic tendency towards subsumption of everything shows itself by the classification of people themselves. In other words, the critique of topology should not neglect the fact that large numbers of people are no longer, or rather never were, individuals. The point then is not to unconsciously use role methodology which takes as natural the result of an unnatural process. It is to use the procedure, if at all, critically. Already Marx used the term character mask to mean not that men and women were mechanically divided into role and authentic self, but that character was the precipitation of extra individual social forces that penetrated the individual. As Adorno wrote of the topology used in the authoritarian personality, it is critical topology in the sense that it comprehends the typification of men itself as a social function. That the blank espousal of individuality and humanism on the one hand, and a scientific behavioral psychology on the other, leave little to choose shows well enough the contemporary configuration of these alternatives. Behaviorism, a la Skinner, of beyond freedom and dignity, would phase out as unscientific freedom and individuality for new and improved behavior modification. The progressive note here is the materialistic accent. Skinner disdains the spiritualities and abstractions that are the stuff of the humanists. What he writes of alienation could have been written by a socialist. The fact that young people drop out of school and refuse to get jobs is not due to feelings of alienation but to defective social environments. Yet the progressive and confident materialism degenerates into the insoluble contradictions of positivism. Skinner accepts the ideology of freedom and individuality as if it were the motor of history and not its ideology. In analyzing the social disorder, he shifts the blame to the ideology. With the courage of his logic, then, he decrees the opposite the abolition of freedom by way of behavior modification, a souped-up environment in the name of a new scientific value, survival. The irony, is that freedom in, in, the irony is that freedom and individuality have only existed in their mangled bourgeois form. To propose junking them in the name of survival is to propose the very society we now have, one that subsists exactly by an ethos of survival, paying lip service to freedom and the individual while rewarding the victors and punishing the victims. Freedom and individuality have never been more than adornments for an ugly environment of survival of the fittest. To go beyond them can only mean to realize them. Otherwise, to go beyond is only to further sink into a society that reduced them to lies in the first place. Appropriately, the protest against this materialism in the name of humanity comes from an ideologue of the establishment that daily wrongs humanity. The sham indign indignation of a former vice president of the republic toward a behaviorism that threatens the sanctity of the individual is sustained only by the big lie technique. Even a glimmer of the truth is too much. Here, too, the ideology of freedom and, ind and individuality is accepted as truth itself, only with different conclusions. We are to suppose that reality does not exist, and that those who have suggested that individuals could be modified were the very first to dream it up. In truth, individuals have been modified and manipulated for a long time, and the alibi has often been freedom and individuality. The contradictions of ideology and reality are resolved by these two alternatives, differently but, but identically. The latter, with the acts of law and order, would keep the lies coming so as to forget a reality that gives the lie to the lies. 
The behaviorist would give up the ideology so as to repair a reality that needs it no longer. The humanist psychology is conformist in essence and trappings. It is the ideology of liberation of a one-dimensional society. Such psychology has forgotten what it never knew. The psychoanalytic, social, and political theory of the heroic era of bourgeois thought. Succumbing with enthusiasm to the social amnesia, it repeats the adages of an age as if they were discoveries of the future. Nothing is lacking in their writings. One can find in the sage of the self-actualizing personality, Maslow, advice on how to defeat the Russians, praise of the capitalist entrepreneur, and more. He tells us in Eupsychian Management, a book an admirer calls Maslow's reply to Das Capital, how to figure out whether a job with a higher salary, which entails leaving one's home and friends, is worth the move. I have asked myself how much money is it worth to me to give up my friendship with my best friends. If, for instance, I arbitrarily assign a value of $1,000 a year to having an intimate friend, which is certainly a modest figure, then this new job, which has been offered at a raise of, let's say, 2000 or 3000 or $4,000 a year, simply is not what it looked like at first. I may actually be losing value or dollar value. Jesus. This is the thinking, language, and style of domination. Values are dollar values. How to get the most from a buck. What Marx once wrote of Bentham, that he was a genius of bourgeois stupidity, could be said of Maslow, except that, except that Maslow was no genius. What is new in such formulations is not that friendship can be figured in dollars and cents, but the supreme confidence that such reasoning is the very quintessence of humanism. To maintain this fraud is possible only by the feat of forgetting that the post-Freudians have performed effortlessly. The facility with which they present barren comments as wisdom cannot be explained by personal defects. Rather, it is derived from the movement of society that is squeezing out of existence autonomous mind and thought. What is happening is not only the decline of thought, but its repression.